good morning to all of us who are joining us uh, today. Um, we continue our webinar series on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic across the different sectors of the real estate industry. Today, we will be talking about the business process outsourcing uh, industry, or BPO, as we um, more popularly refer to it, and how that sector is dealing with the current pandemic, the challenges, and what the outlook is post-COVID. Um, I just want to share something that we're doing differently uh, this time. We are opening um, the floor to some questions at the end of the webinar. So um, as we go through the webinar, think of these questions that you might want to, to post to our guests today. And towards the end, we will open the uh, Zoom chat room for you to type in these questions, okay? So uh, my name is Estela Cancio, and I will be co-hosting this webinar with uh, my colleague, Raymond Velasquez. Raymond, good morning. Good morning, Estela. Uh, good morning, everyone. So we are really excited to, to do this webinar, especially that the topic is a very, very interesting uh, topic. Um, of course, uh, to begin, we're, we're very honored to have uh, two distinguished guests for today who had uh, extreme experience in the BPO sector. Uh, myself, uh, I'm, have, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have the chance to work with these guys in different uh, capacities. So let me start. Uh, our, our first guest is uh, the CEO of iScale Solutions, um, Mr. Yanis Hanen. So Yanni uh, has been in the Philippines for nearly 15 years. He is the founder of iScale Solutions, a BPO company specializing in the software development based in Makati. So prior to iScale Solutions, Yanni was the CEO for Friendster in the Philippines, which is I'm sure very, very familiar for everyone. And before leaving in Manila, uh, Yanni worked for a number of Silicon Valley technology companies in the U.S in various technical and managerial positions. Uh, Yanis also co-founded RightCloud, a public cloud service company that was sold to Software One in 2019. Welcome, Yanis, and thank you for being with us. Thank you. Good to be here. Hello, everyone. Thank you. And of course, our second, our second guest is uh, Mr. Sherwin Ke, who is uh, the Vice President and Country Head of Wonders Corporation. Um, Sherwin is close to to 20 years of experience managing Fortune 100 companies, including expatriate uh, assignments in the US, Europe, Asia Pacific, name it, the Caribbean, Latin America. And uh, he brings a wealth of knowledge having managed offshore and onshore operations, holding various leadership and executive roles. Uh, prior to joining Wonders Corporation, uh, Sherwin served as the vice president for and, and global head of for strategic accounts and Asia Pacific um, operations head for Conduit, um, where he was heavily involved in three strategic areas: uh, the build, improve, and sustain, which helped the uh, the growth of the organization. Uh, welcome, Sherwin, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So as we move forward. Um, I don't think it can be denied that the BPOs uh, play a huge role in our country's economy. Uh, next to the OFW remittances, it brings in the largest dollar revenue to the country. Amazing. And about 26 US dollars uh, per year. So, uh, 26 yeah. billion. 26 billion. Uh, billion, yes. Correct. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, thank you, Estela. Yes. Yeah, and that's right, Raymond. There are about 850 or so registered outsourcing centers today, and they employ 1.3 million people. But with the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, most of these companies are forced to review its staffing and day-to-day -day operations. So Yanis, in your view, how has this affected the BPO industry in general? And also for iScale, in terms of operations and client behavior, you know what changes have you seen? Okay. Well, I think on the on uh, not just in iScale but in the BPO as a as a whole, I think the 
the BPO community in the Philippines was, was a bit caught by surprise. I think despite all the good plans that were put in place, I don't think anybody had initially envisioned a crisis of that size, right? So, so people in the BPO industry tend to usually prepare for weather-related events, like events that will usually last for a short duration, like a few days, like there will be a typhoon, or a storm, mm -hmm. but something of that, uh, of that impact was not really planned, right? And so despite having like multiple sites, like we have multiple sites, uh, but all sites are affected, right? And so what we've seen in the, in the BPO industry in general is that it's, it's a challenge for BPOs to, to keep full capacity, right? To, to have all their staff remain operational because they're not able to get into the office and actually perform work, right? And one of the, one of the challenges is that um, working from home is not always something that you can do in the BPO industry because of uh, either because of regulation, like clients will not want uh, employees to be working remotely because they have to be physically in, in one place or because they have to have customer interactions which are not necessarily well done from a home environment, right? There will be noises or people will not be able to be um, coming on video properly, things like that, right? So, so the BPO industry in general has to adjust, but they were a little bit caught by surprise, right? That's, that's my, general, uh, my general view on what's, uh, what's happening, right? Um, I think as far as uh, our customers, uh, customers did not react right away, right? It took about two weeks for customers to fully appreciate the gravity of the, of the crisis. So for the first two weeks, as far as we were concerned, we did not really get too many distress calls from customers, but quickly after that, things started sort of piling up, right? And they were, there were sort of different groups of people, different groups of customers, and that's really depending on the, the sector or the vertical that they serve. So we service customers in the, in the travel industry, so those are the, the hardest bits, right? I mean, I would say pretty much, uh, we have pretty much no more work for the travel industry at this moment. Like um, in, in the contracts, typically you have this little clause that's called force majeure, right? So it's essentially, it doesn't mean that the contract really stops in case of a crisis, but it puts things on hold and you can renegotiate terms and conditions of the contract for the duration of the crisis, right? And I would say most of our customers in those severely impacted sectors have triggered that clause, right? And they, they came to us and they said, well, uh, one important thing is we want to keep our team. We want to keep our team ready to restart whenever we are ready to restart. But for the time being, we need to find ways to weather this storm, right? And so, so I think it's important because customers do not want to retrench people. They want to keep the, uh, the, the people they had uh, through us, but they want to put it on hold and they want to find ways to either reduce uh, the level of operation or uh, stop it, like pause it completely, right? Um, so some, some sectors are, are actually badly hit. I, would, I was mentioning the, the travel. On the flip side, we have customers who actually take this as an opportunity because their business is actually accelerating for the crisis. And those would be customers who have, like uh, we have a couple of customers who work on products on social media. And because people are not going uh, to social media for, for purchases, like there, there, are, there are changes in the pattern uh, of uh, the consumer habits. So a lot of people, and it's not just in the Philippines, I would say on the, in the developed markets, uh, because sometimes the e-commerce sites are having issues delivering or that there are alternate ways that start shipping up, right? And so, so customers who work on social media, like advertising on social media is pretty heavy at the moment. And there are a lot of uh, ad hoc uh, selling patterns that are developing. So we have customers who are actually bullish at this moment, but in fairness, mm -hmm. it's very few of them in that position. So the majority are adopting a, a protective sort of posture where they don't want to let go of their team but they want to reduce cost, right? And that's, that's what we experience from, from our customers as of now. So Sherwin, how about in your business? How has the pandemic affected the operation side and the client side? Right, right. I mean, similar to what Yanis mentioned, you know, to begin with, it's safe to say that no company has really prepared for something like this. Uh, companies would have had BCPs in relation to natural calamities, maybe social activities, uh, but not a pandemic where both a BPO and a client can actually be affected. And the unfortunate truth is no one really knows how long this will last. Mm -hmm. uh, on the operation side, we do look at it in two aspects. Uh, one, you have an aspect where operations would have clients, where the uh, impact of the pandemic is not heavily felt, say in the telco or maybe banking industries. 
The second aspect relates to operations, like what Yanis mentioned, where there's a significant impact when it comes to volume, your travel, transportation, and to some degree, your retail industries. In the first aspect where you would have BPO operations that would relatively have the same volume, the challenge, therefore, is more local, meaning there was a lockdown that was established, that was implemented, and then depending on a company's reaction time, there may not be enough people to handle the volume of their calls. So the opportunity of getting as much revenue as you can and taking advantage of that opportunity may not be there for those situations or for those companies that were not able to react quickly right. um, in, in the pandemic. On the other hand, you will have operations that would suddenly have excessive volume or excessive workforce because the, comp the, the client then has a significant decline or drop in their volume, right? In that situation, you then have an overlay of the challenge of the first aspect where there's an issue of mobility and reliability on the BPO side, while at the same time, you also have the challenge of being able to manage your costs because now you have more than enough resources than what your client needs. As a result, the unfortunate truth is, you know, you'll have BPOs where they've actually resulted to letting go of some of their staff and even down to manager level. Uh, so there's also that impact when it comes to unemployment to some degree. Uh, on the client side, like in our case, for example, the impact and the default focus that we have was more internal, I would say, uh, whether or not it's about, you know, making adjustments on what we can do now, given the unpredictability of the situation. Uh, what can we do for our employees for them to be able to get by in these trying times? Or maybe also look at what opportunities exist in our contracts, both in the short term or in the long term, what kind of amendments can be made so that mm -hmm. it allows us and it gives us some flexibility, right? Um, at the same time, I think it's important to note that as a client, this pandemic has also led us to focus more on making adjustments to our own forecasts in relation to the sudden drop in volume, for example, which means companies that are supporting us would be surprised somewhat in terms of the changes all because of the pandemic, right? Uh, I've also you know, worked and then talked to some of the other companies where they've also started looking at the methodology, for example, to which they're getting billed, even down to yeah. the rates to which they're getting billed for. Again, all of this because of the surprise that everybody went through, right? Uh, those are just some of the examples that, that, you know, that how the impact of the pandemic was uh, on the BPO industry, both for the service provider as well as with the clients. I think in a nutshell, the lack of readiness and lack of, I would say, structural flexibility for some companies has actually led to some of these businesses uh, having a significant loss in their financials. Very interesting. I mean, I'm I'm sure us in the in the real estate industry can be able to help you in some of those uh, adjustments as well moving forward. I mean, we we work hand in hand with with mm -hmm. you guys, and uh, those are definitely the things you can explore once this uh, pandemic is um, done. Uh, Sherwin, I, I I pick up from your what you mentioned that I think you're both Wonders Corporation is both uh, operating as a client side and a a BPO provider for. For this industry so what are your expectations to your to your provider as a, as a client I mean amid this current situation uh, on, on the client side as a client the expectation for our service providers is obviously to take care of our customers uh, that's you know first and foremost very important right uh, but at the same time one of the things that we look at for a or with a with a service provider is having the same flexibility, I would say, in the same efficiencies, you know, which is also in line with our core values. We've always, you know, made it a point to run things efficiently. Uh, our organization, for example, is relatively flat when it comes to our structure. And that actually allows us to remove several layers of approval in order to get things done, right? You've seen bigger companies where there's so many layers, uh, it allows, you know, it, it prolongs the approval process. But in our case, that's not the case. Um, for one, you know, if it means identifying how many resources we need it, as a result of the declining volume, we were able to quickly act on that uh, between our team and the BPOs that support us, you know, how many should be working from home, how many should be in the office. So those things we have done as well as a result of the partnership and the efficiencies that we've done. 
Um, the, the other piece I think that that's worth noting of is the fact that in this pandemic, it's not just the client, meaning us, and not just a service provider that's impacted, but also our own clients. So they also lose customers because of this pandemic. And it also then becomes our responsibility to help make sure that their business survives. Right. Um, every call counts, as I say, and because of how we're structured, because of our setup being a client and a, a service provider ourselves, we have that ability to choose specifically who and where the best people are who can handle our clients, ensuring that excellent customer experience is still you know, provided to them. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, when it comes to our people, they're, they're always and will always be the most important part of our business. Uh, and as a company, we continue to support them in any which way we can. Totally agree. Um, Yanis, for, for the operation of uh, iScale Solutions, I mean, both locally and, and rich and globally, how has the, the pandemic affected your, your operation, your, your expansion plans per se? I mean, both here in the country or in other areas or, I mean, securing some clients. I mean, how, how is it right now in your current operation? Right. Well, I think obviously operations are, are affected. Um, what, what's been important is to, to maintain the level of service we had prior to the, to the crisis and to be, to be very transparent with the clients, right? So what makes this crisis very unique is that I don't think there's, I mean, there's almost no business that remains unaffected. So it's, it's pretty, I would say it's not a difficult discussion to have with your customers to say, well, here is our situation. Tell us about your situation and let's find ways to continue working together in a way that's, that's mutually beneficial, right? So, so we've tried to be very transparent from the beginning about the situations uh, like locally and trying to understand what were the challenges that our customers met. So, so on our hand, what, what, what our strategy has been is, uh, although the offices remain open, uh, actually one of, we have multiple locations. And so one of the locations where we operate was temporarily closed because there was, there was a case in the, in the building. So we figured that uh, uh, we couldn't really 100% uh, count on the physical office presence uh, over time because even though there would be a skeletal force that could be coming to the office, that wasn't really the, the way to go, right? So we, we went for a strategy to really push as many people as possible uh, working from home. And we, the, the way we went about that is essentially to survey every single employee, right? So we knew already where they lived. So we had to go a little bit deeper, right? To figure out, okay, did they have a, a suitable space in their in their house where they could be actually doing productive work, right? Where they're sufficiently equipped uh, in terms of internet connectivity and, and so on, right? And so, so we went through this survey and um, I would say we were lucky in the sense we have a majority of software developers, people who work in the, uh, in, in the software arena. And so they were pretty decently equipped all in all. So there were a few gaps here and there, but we were able to address those and uh, find uh, the missing supply. So typically like internet connection devices, we were able to do that pretty early, right? That was, I would say, our luck because the challenge we have today, right, as we continue through this crisis is really finding equipment, right? Because our, our suppliers uh, are no longer delivering, right? And so as we need additional equipment to sustain the operation or as equipment breaks down and you're starting to run on your spare equipment, it gets pretty difficult to procure uh, and deliver equipment at this point, right? And so, and I was mentioning about alternate ways uh, through social media and other means. And so that's sort of where we are looking at at the moment, right? To procure equipment. There are a lot of uh, businesses that start operating in a different model where they continue selling, but they don't sell through the normal channels anymore, right? And so, so that, that is an operational challenge. And that's something where we're trying to be prepared as best as we can. But since we don't know how long the crisis is going to last, uh, we don't know if that's the right, the right solution at the moment. But clearly for us, the challenge is finding supplies, right? Because computers break, People will have issues at home and maintaining working equipment and working conditions remotely is, is a challenge. Again, I think that's, that's the, you know, even if, like, like what Sherwin mentioned earlier, I mean, even if a BCP was in place before, but not at this capacity where it was affected, not just locally, but globally. Yeah, yeah. We're having conversation with uh, some of our friends also in the industry. And that's the same thing. We're, they're having the same trouble that, that you know you guys are experiencing, and at the same time, looking at some some opportunities as well. I mean, 
uh, again, we go back to adversity producing opportunities for us. So, so that, that's one thing that we definitely look forward. Um, Sherwin, for, for Wonders Corporation, I mean, despite the situation that's happening right now, do you still see like bullish, uh, I mean, in terms of growth, in terms of your expansion here locally and, and in other countries or, or which area? Right. The, the opportunity really. I mean, that's yeah, still- in, in our case, you know, the plan to grow and expand is definitely still there. Uh, we've not stopped selling our products and services. Uh, however, we do know that the, there will be a slow economic recovery across the globe, right? Uh, and so we're adjusting our timelines based on that. Coincidentally, you know, even prior to the pandemic, we've carefully thought of our expansion plans. And just to share with you what we have in mind is our expansion is not limited to just one facility or one city. We've always looked at not going beyond 500 folks in one location, which therefore creates flexibility for us in terms of resource availability across the Philippines, for example, or the skills that are required across, you know, different products and services that we do, which I think will play a big role as we all go through, you know, in identifying this new normal, right? We also have the benefit of having our own developers and engineers that helps fine tune our infrastructure to ensure that we reduce, if not eliminate the fat in our systems, therefore allowing a more efficient and effective work from home setup. So plans are still in place where we're very fortunate to have that. It's just a matter of making some adjustments in terms of the timelines when we think, you know, we can expand to that, you know, to the number that we're aiming for. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. If I may add on, on expansion, like when, one aspect I found interesting to us is really the, the hiring. So to be, to be honest, I was, I was very skeptical about hiring in these conditions, right? I thought candidates would not, uh, I mean, I, I was thinking essentially we would be able to, to reach out to candidates and do video interviews but I was not really convinced that candidates would be committing for a new role uh, with us entirely remotely, right? And, and surprisingly, I was, I was proven a little bit wrong on that. So we've been, we've been actually able to hire a number of people uh, entirely remotely, right? So meaning people have interviewed through uh, the normal interview system, which already involved video interview in the past. But the part of offer negotiation and contract mm-hmm. signing and onboarding is done totally remotely. So today we have, we have new people who have joined the last couple of weeks that we've never physically met, right? And I admit this was a bit, it, it, it was sort of strange to think about that initially, but the growth is actually there. And there are, there are actually a number of people in the, in the job market at the moment, a lot of candidates, uh, either looking for better opportunity or also because they've been retrenched or their company is not doing well and they are looking for you know, companies that appear to be more stable, right? So to me, it's an encouraging trend, something very new also because if you had asked me three months ago, like, would you, would you hire somebody, you know, just purely right. on video, I would probably have answered no, right? So that, that's something that's interesting for us. And I'm sure in, in our guests today, I mean, guys watching us, uh, not just, you know, fellow operators, or there might be some people in our audience that uh, would be considering that. And so, so guys, I mean, Yanis and, and Sherwin will be here <laughs> for uh, current employment in this current situation. By all means, yes. <laughs> okay, so if you're hiring new new employees, and for those who are um, in your skeleton staff, um, safety and well-being, of course, is, is a concern for all. Yanis, you mentioned earlier um, that you, I think you sent out a survey uh, to your employees to find out who's um, capable of working at home and who are are, um, absolutely whose presence are absolutely needed. So how do you address safety and well-being for those at home and for those who are in um, workspaces that are that are not home? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I I think I think the 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 whole of time we have followed so far is that we do not impose the working conditions on the employee. So similar to a weather event like where there would be a storm or uh, like a, a major weather problem, uh, we don't force people to go in harm's way to come to the office, right? And so mm-hmm. similarly here, uh, in the in the early stage of the crisis, we've, we've surveyed people, but the, 
the, uh, the recommendation was, well, if you don't feel safe in the office, we're going to have to find an alternate way for you to work without being physically present in the office, right? So I think it's important because we want employees to feel, to feel safe uh, at all times. Uh, and so we need to be sort of creative a little bit in the way they're going to be able to work, uh, to work remotely. So, so definitely there is a lot of anxiety from the employee standpoint and from the client standpoint around the, around, around the virus. So the goal is not to scare people, like not to scare employees, but not mm -hmm. to scare clients as well. So the, um, the challenge we have is there's a lot of information. And so customers are constantly asking, like, what is the situation in the Philippines? But not being here also, they don't, they don't necessarily understand very well how the normal situation in Philippines happens to be, right? So, so we try to remain like factual and not exaggerate the situation. Or when we don't know, I think it's fair to say we don't know. Or we refer them to more uh, informed sources. So, because in this time, I think a lot of people have a lot of different opinions or a lot of views, but that's not necessarily what the reality looks like, right? And so customers are trying to also figure out what's really happening on the ground. So one important message for them is to ensure them that their employees are safe and that we are finding ways to, 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 keep, them, uh, to keep them productive, right? Um, but in terms of concrete measures, so for people who who stayed in the office, we obviously try to follow the, the social distancing. So having a lot of spare space made it easy, right? So we sort of scattered people who were, who were working. But this was in, at the beginning. Like as of now, we, we pretty much don't have anyone left in the, in the different locations. And we only do occasional face-to-face -face meetings when there is really hard paperwork to be done, right? Because sadly, some of our partners, like the first one, will work a lot with, with banks, right? Uh, and so... Banks are still very much paper and signature, but over time we've been able to, to replace uh, hard copy with uh, either, so not really digital documentation, but using uh, courier systems to just circulate the papers and have the mm -hmm. signatory sign the relevant documents, right? So initially it sounds like it's not possible, but over time, uh, day after day, when you really focus on the problem, you find, you find solutions and physical presence is pretty much longer required. Has it been the same, Sherwin, at um, Wonders? Do you do you still have people coming into a physical physical workplace? It's a combination of of both, given the structure that we have, right? In, where we have our own captive operations, where some are working from home, some are in the office with social distancing, like what Yanis mentioned. While at the same time, we are well supported by our BPO partners as they run the operations on their side of the fence, right? I think that we're, we're very fortunate, you know, being able to have that setup. And the relationship that we have, you know, also is tied to looking after the safety and welfare of our employees on both ends, uh, which again, going back to what I was sharing in terms of our organization, having a leaner and, and flat organization has actually given us a lot of benefits. Um, you have the, the financial, you know, material support that you provide the employees, but I think it's also important to have that, you know, mental, you know, um, psychological support, if you will, removing the anxieties, right? And all, it, all, it all boils down to communication. Uh, in fact, right. we just did a countrywide town hall last week with myself and our CEO, Steve Lin. Uh, it was an opportunity for us to give everyone an update on what's happening around the globe, given that there's real news, there's fake news, uh, how we are doing as yeah. a company straight from us as leaders and what steps are we taking to support them and to ensure that, you know, uh, to ensure their safety and welfare. Um, given the, the, the other examples that Yanis provided from our side uh, as early as March, just right about when the announcement was made in terms of the ECQ, we've right away given the 13 month pay in advance to support our employees, just to make sure they're ahead in terms of getting their groceries and stuff, their supply, mm -hmm. right? Uh, prior to the lockdown. Um, this month, we've also started giving them food supply uh, specific to the rank and file employees because the, while, while the industry is rich in terms of its contribution to the country, the reality also is we do have workforce in the industry that lives paycheck to paycheck. Right. Yes. And yes. given that they're not able to have the infrastructure to enable them to work at home, yet not able as well to go to the office as a company, I think it is also, you know, in, in our core value to at least provide something to the employees. And what that's what we've done so far, um, at least on 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 our employees, you know, with our team and such. Uh, on the client side, we do look at it both from our existing clients as well as perspective. 
uh, we continue to take care of our existing clients and provide even more flexibility to the products and services that we offer. Um, one of the things that we've um, allowed or at least approved, you know, in terms of our partnership with our clients is allowing them to pause on the services we provide because, you know, they need to close shop. What's interesting about that mm -hmm. was as things start getting better as well in the U.S., these are also the same clients that said, okay, you know, we're, we're starting to get back to normal. Let's reactivate your service, right? So the flexibility on the services we provide, the partnership just that, that gets solidified as a result of the pandemic uh, actually becomes stronger than ever. With that, you then demonstrate and, and share the same thing to prospective clients, right? You tell them that, hey, this is how flexible we are with our existing clients. You know, we can do the same thing with you. But more importantly, also demonstrate as a company, we're resilient. We're resilient in terms of right. overcoming such situations. So I think those are, those are very important in this time of, uh, in this kind of situation. So that's, a, that's a wonderful thing to do. You know, to, to, you, you're living up to the name of your company. <laughs> I mean, for the clients and for your employees. So, yeah. Thank you. So um, we uh, would like to remind our audience that we will have um, questions for our guests. Um, uh, there's an, an opportunity coming up. So I think at this point, um, we will open uh, the chat room for members of the audience to type in their questions while we ask some, some final points. Uh, Raymond? I think um, uh, an, an interesting uh, question also we wanted to hear from our speakers today is, of course, uh, it's important to, to hear how they are addressing the situation both for their employees and their, and their clients. Is, I mean, as we move forward uh, towards, I mean, after the lockdown, uh, for, for both Yanis and, and, uh, and uh, Sherwin, uh, what would be the new normal like? I mean, what are the opportunities for both like like for Yanis's uh, business industry where he's basically doing a lot of technology and and he's very much involved with his clients from hiring their employees to managing their their operation to the same as what Wonders Corporation is doing as well. No? I mean, uh, we know that the thing with the BPO industry is it's a huge uh, playing field. I mean, we can talk to a lot of BPO players and they, they cater to different types of market. I mean, at least for your specific industry or coverage, how do you see the new normal and what are the opportunities that, that you see which we can impart to our audience for today? I'll start with you, Yanis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a broad question. So what, what the new normal will be. Uh, but I think definitely the, so the, the, the new normal is going, so I, I want to go back to what Sherwin was saying a little bit earlier, the fact of being like resilient as a company and flexible. So I think this is something very important, right? Because it's a bit like in the financial crisis where bank a stress test or where they simulate stress situations to see whether they would withstand um, uh, an important financial crisis. So for, for the BPO industry, we are a bit in the same situation. Companies that are not going to be able to show uh, flexibility with their customers are at risk, right? And on the opposite side, uh, companies that are resilient and able to strengthen relationship with their customers and essentially show them that uh, they've been able to, to go through this crisis together with the customer and they're going to have a strong relationship uh, as a result, right? So I think in the, in the new normal, there, there are a few hard things, right? There is uh, the first question I'm asking myself, and honestly, I don't have the answer for some yet, is how will I convince my employees to come back to the office, right? For those who are well settled uh -huh. at home and who've been able to work for, you know, a couple of months, uh, fairly productive, I know they they uh, they have uh, they have uh, difficulty staying home much longer, and they'll be really happy to get back to the office. But some others may actually enjoy the setup at home and may not want to be back to the office. So I think the new normal is going to definitely be a mix of that. Right? Uh, there's going to be more flexibility between 
companies and their employees, but also between companies and their customers. Right. I think that's that's one um, that that's like there, there's going to be a strong shift in level of expectation or habits of employees or customers with regard to to the level of service. Right. Um, I think there's going to be, in my view, I mean that's that's the way we look. Going to slow down our, I would say, brick and mortar investment, like office space, uh, travel, uh, things that usually, I mean, we, we realize big budget for our, for our operation. And now that travel is reduced, we see this budget that could be reallocated to better collaboration tools or uh, better tools in general remotely, right? And I think that's another, that's another shift. I, I don't expect the travel industry to really recover very quickly, or I don't expect people to start flying around what they were doing what they were doing before so those things are going to be to be slowing down and i think companies are going to be more frugal on those areas and are going to trade it for their remote setup better tools better uh, uh, business continuity programs as well if if they felt that their their bcp was not uh, was not strong um, and i think particularly for bpo there's probably going to be also a bit more competition with freelancers because obviously freelancers are a small scale small scale operations right but there are a lot of people freelancing at home and it's going to be interesting to see how those those different segments of the industry uh, who are going to be to be working together because now um, you know a, a lot of people will be at home like freelancers are so it's going to be interesting to see how those two uh, behave we'll, we'll have to observe that as well uh, as far as we are concerned I'm, 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 I'm expecting that we are going to be we're not going to be expanding much as far as office. Uh, and I expect a, a significant portion of our employees to probably remain at home or come to the office only once in a while after this, at least for medium term. Um, and so we'll probably be making uh, office space adjustments to, to not really assign one desk per employee, but really have uh, the opportunity to come to the office whenever they want, but to make it a lot more flexible. That, that's how I see that. Thank you, Yanis. How about uh, from your end, Sherwin? Yeah, uh, I see the new normal uh, across several aspects of the business, uh, probably segmented between you know people, process, and uh, technology. Um, the the workforce or the work from home piece of the people aspect, right? Where companies will certainly start identifying roles and positions that can operate in a work from home setup. That's one. But on the flip side, you'll then have employees as well, you know, who will start thinking of investing on their own internet bandwidth, their own computer equipment to enable them for a work from home setting. Uh, that's one. Uh, the next one, as it relates to people, will be about the roles and responsibilities. This will certainly be redefined. Um, as roles and responsibilities are currently defined based on performance expectations, where you have your metrics, targets that you need to achieve, this will change to having roles as well where there's going to be a much larger element of people management skills of you know high end or high level business skills problem solving strategic thinking amongst other things uh, expectations from leaders will definitely be higher uh, the reality is this pandemic brought out the best and in some cases the worst in leaders unfortunately right uh, this brought out leaders that companies can count on, can truly count on. This therefore sets the bar higher for any company uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to expectations from their team. Uh, and then going back to, to performance and expectations, definitely high performance will be expected more than ever, right? Whether as a result of companies wanting to recover, uh, whether the storm, if you will, or just gear up for growth once everything is done and over with from a pandemic standpoint. Each individual, I would say, should realize that no matter how long you've been in an organization, it wouldn't matter as much anymore as the output that you actually give the company you work for. Uh, I would say that the value of tenure has diminished because of this pandemic, and the value of performance outputs is actually now playing an even much bigger role than ever. So that's what I see on the people aspect. Um, from a process standpoint where we kind of touched on several times BCP, BCP will now be seen uh, between two lenses, as a service provider uh, and, and the client's lens as well, versus prior to the pandemic, you're just looking at it from your side 
if there's a, a natural calamity, what will I do to ensure that my clients, you know, customers still get uh, addressed, gets handled. Now there's also that discussion. What if it's on the client side that I would have issues? How do we as a service provider, you know, uh, trigger a BCP as it relates to that, right? Um, it would also trigger a lot of discussions about, you know, how a BPO should act and react in those situations, whether it be operational, whether it be facilities, whether it be financial in that nature. Unfortunately, not all BCPs are, are set up that way. Um, companies, both clients and BPOs, will definitely start looking at real estate uh, in, in a different way. Uh, as we go through and identify what the real or what the new normal would be, uh, companies will start reviewing their real estate, how their real estate is spread across different locations, maybe even look at the span of operations uh, across the different cities where they exist. Um, we all know of some companies that have multiple floors in a particular building, and just because of one coronavirus incident, that entire building just shuts down, right? right. So it crippled a company that has multiple uh, floors operating in one building. So everybody, you know, that, that's a learning for everybody, not just for a company like that. And because of this, companies will then start rethinking how to spread their resources, you know, how it would look like across different facilities, different locations. In fact, the entire concept of co-working space, I think will also play an important role now more yes. than ever. Uh, right. Both from a cost perspective, as well as what I would say as experience sharing, because that's the whole intent of uh, a co-working space. Right. Uh, somebody from a different company, but we essentially do the same thing, then it wouldn't hurt really to share our own experiences on how this change, this, this uh, crisis, unfortunately, right, is affecting you know, both sides. Right? Uh, and then, of course, you'll have the focus on efficiencies you know when it comes to processes uh ai i would say is going to be uh right. back on top in terms of a topic of discussion if it's not on top already uh, rpas for sure right when it comes to you know re eliminating maybe manual work repetitive work uh anything can be done by by a bot definitely that's going to be uh, happening as well um I mentioned about contracts. Uh, definitely contracts will be reviewed. It is being reviewed as we speak for a lot of companies, whether in terms of the rates, uh, the payment terms, the conditions in the contract, right? Um, bottom line, even down to maybe ter even termination clauses because every company now would be going after the level of flexibility yeah. that they would like to have, uh, especially in times like this. Uh, and then lastly, from a technology standpoint, uh, similar to what we're doing now, it's identifying, you know, what kind of, what fat can we eliminate from our platform to allow it to work effectively and efficiently uh, in a personal slash home-based internet facility. Um, and of course, investments for sure. I think, you know, the, the CIOs uh, are going to be uh, happy having this voice this time where their recommendations, proposals for technology investments uh, will definitely be uh, up on that discussion point as well as we start going back to or go through uh, our new normal. Interesting. Uh, especially you mentioned uh, the real estate sector. Uh, I'm sure you know where to point those guys if they need assistance in the real estate. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> and then I am right there. Reviewing contracts is also something, it's an offer for uh, us. Uh, something that we do. So, yeah. We have a couple of questions here, guys. I mean, I think since mm -hmm. it's been out the, the chat room for some questions, uh, just in line to what you, Yanis, and, and Sherwin just mentioned earlier, um, the first one is uh, from Jello Pavela, who's uh, asking on the, since most of us are working from home, uh, and it, it has significantly impacted the, the bandwidth issues and connectivity. So what, how, what do you think should the government uh, or, or the private sector or service provider be, be doing this to support uh, the demand right now, especially in, this, in the BPO industry? I mean, maybe uh, Yanis, you can, you can answer that for us. 
Yeah, I mean, home, home based, uh, I mean, luckily, I would say uh, the infrastructure has already improved significantly in the last uh, two, three years. Right? If you look at the price of the, of the MBPS, I would say three, four years ago, you would be paying probably about three to five times the price you're paying today, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, we've, we've renegotiated uh, pretty much all our uh, contracts uh, midway as, as we saw the competition building up in that, in that segment. Uh, and prices going down, we went to our existing ISPs and we told them, look, this is what the market uh, is offering at the moment. And again, surprisingly, they were, they were all happy to match or to, to revise their contract midway, right? Which is something we're facing now in, a, in the crisis with our own customers, right? So I think renegotiating the contracts, reviewing them uh, because of competition building was, was a good thing. So I would say in general, the infrastructure has improved uh, for business offering, for residential offering similarly, right? Uh, uh, you have a lot more access to, to high-speed internet uh, in, in a number of areas. It's not perfect yet, but I think it's going in the right direction, right? The, the difficulty is always going to be the last mile, right? You're going to cover 80% um, of the area uh, fairly quickly, but the last 20% will be very expensive, right? Um, and again, I, and I think on that, uh, you know, it, it's going to be, I, I think the, uh, the customers and uh, the ISPs are going to meet uh, halfway, meaning you know, we have, I mean, we have engineers who move uh, when they, when they change uh, job, right? So they wanted to be closer to the office. So I think if people want to stay at home or need the right, uh, the right level of connectivity, they may be actually open of moving around a little bit to get in an area of service, right? Uh, I don't think uh, uh, you, can, you can expect working from home uh, with, with bad connectivity. So if people really want to do it, uh, it, it, it will be it will be a good effort, right? Propagating uh, high speed fiber in, in different areas. But I think people while that happens, people will probably also be a bit flexible and will move to, to better areas. Mm -hmm. and, and then I think, you know, in addition to that as well, um, and, and all of us in the industry are very mm -hmm. familiar with uh, IBPAP, right? I think more than ever, IBPAP will have a much louder voice this time. Uh, because mm -hmm. of just how important technology will play a much bigger role, you know, once the pandemic is over. Um, whether it be in a work from home setting, whether it be in just ensuring that there's very, very close to 100% uptime, right, that will play a big role. So it's really IBPAP having a much louder voice this time with the government compared to previous months, previous years, where there's a bit of, of uh, not really resistance, maybe lack of knowledge, lack of awareness on what the industry does for the country, uh, there's definitely going to be more recognition towards that, which obviously translates to what Yanis was mentioning, uh, much better connectivity, maybe 80% at par to a Singapore, if not a Hong Kong, right? But wow. definitely, you know, uh, to that degree. That I'm looking forward to, personally. <laughs> That would yeah. be good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it will take time. Like, obviously, we can't expect this to happen overnight. Although we've seen, I mean, we, we've seen pretty significant acceleration of the, the service level uh, in the last two, three years. But it will still take a few more years to really to go in, in, in many places. So I think in between, yeah, the, we'll have to find short-term solutions before the long-term solutions are in place. Correct. Um, last, last week, we had that discussion uh, on the co-working, as, as uh, Sherwin mentioned also earlier, where we see how that, that industry can help. I mean, the flexible workspace, it's not just the work co-working in particular. I mean, the, having a flexible workspace scenario mm -hmm. uh, can help us rebound in this current situation little by little as we you know, move forward on a bigger, um, you know, solution and a new normal. So there, there's another question from Mr. Uh, Erwin Gabino. What mm -hmm. innovations do you foresee being needed by the industry to adapt to the new norm uh, post ECQ? Is there a unique opportunity? I think you mentioned it earlier, uh, uh, Sherwin, also. Yeah, there, there's a couple. I think, you know, both Yanis and I were mentioning a couple of things. One from a technology standpoint, of course, you know, mm -hmm. uh, AI. allowing more people to, one, trim the, fat, trim the fat in terms of the platforms that they currently use in their companies. Uh, the second one, the SSL, in terms of uh, artificial intel intelligence, uh, process automation, RPAs, you know, bots, essentially, that would all come into play. Uh, there's going to be, for sure, a much more or a much aggressive push on 
virtual hiring. Um, I think that innovation will definitely be coming. It has already yes. come. Uh, in fact, maybe I'd say a year or two, uh, two years ago, but the acceptance of it will actually going to be much greater this time around. Um, that's one of the innovations, right, amongst other things, for sure. Yeah, to, to, to expand on this virtual hiring, so I was mentioning earlier that I was myself surprised at the fact that people would take offers without meeting us. Um, internally, we've actually really uh, looked hard into our hiring uh, approach uh, in, the last, in the last few weeks. So when we screen uh, technical people or the, the tools we use to, to vet their technical skills and to make sure that we are hiring the, the right person, right? So I think there's a, there's a strong opportunity there in that area too, because uh, companies are going to be more and more hiring people remotely, and you need to have uh, a consistent set of tools or a consistent process. Uh, and over time, you can you should have confidence that you're hiring the right people. So, so we, we found a lot of gaps in our process, uh, and it was difficult initially to do it fully remotely. And now slowly, we are actually reaching reaching that level. So I think from a platform standpoint, there are definitely for tools um, and interview techniques that need to be developed and nurtured for for virtual hiring. Actually, as we move forward in this webinar series, I think uh, the next part of this BPO Outlook is we're going to have uh, guest speakers also from from the from that area. From the HR, HR component part, of yeah. Be a huge role, especially in this current situation. Um, hiring these employees, these BPO personnel, even the executives, how it has affected them, uh, and then. The other support uh, system in the BPO industry. I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, very uh, thankful hearing from you guys how how the situation is uh, affecting your your current uh, operation, and then you see the opportunities. And as we move forward, we we have uh, other guests that they think can share uh, their expertise as well, and us also in the in the support group of this industry, providing the real estate component of it. I mean, definitely, I mean, we'd be happy to share our, our expertise and, and knowledge how we can all work together in this current situation. I think we have one, one last question. We have time for one more question. This one is from Jello Fabelia also. So do we foresee PESA in reviewing its existing relationships with BPO companies in terms of being more flexible in moving assets between office locations? So, uh, how do we take that question? Yeah, this one is this one is interesting, right? It, uh, yeah. So it's actually for for all of us, us us four. Right. <laughs> uh -huh. um, there, there's definitely, at least from my side, there will definitely be a realization that hey, maybe what the change we wanted to make a year or so ago may not be applicable this time around. Um, is, it, it then becomes a next question of what we currently have in terms of PESA and its benefits. Do we then mm -hmm. continue that on or do we need to make it more appealing this time? Because you have all of those in mind and along with that, you have your build, build, build. So you have PESA somewhat stuck in the middle between developers, between the government and the developers, and companies who are now thinking, hey, work from home is actually working. I can invest on technology. Right. Then maybe I don't need to be PESA registered, as an example, right? Just to put it out there, right? So this one is tricky. I, I don't know if you guys can chime in as well, but you know, this is a sort of a, like a chess game, like depending on who moves first, I think the other, the other side will, will then react depending on what the move is. Um, I'll chime in. I just have a, a short thing um, to add there actually. I, I'm hoping that the process for getting um, PESA reviews moves on uh, more smoothly. I think of late, there has been some uh, delays in, in getting approval. So, um, and it has uh, hindered the, uh, the start of one construction to moving in of new um, BPOs. Um, and, and 
in general, operations have slowed down because expansion spaces are not available. You know, PESA registered expansion spaces are not available. So, so um, I'm, I'm grateful this question has come up and I, I'm hoping um, someone from the agency is listening and the agency above that agency is listening too. So, so that we can get the process reviewed and moving smoothly. So Raymond, you were- From my end, uh, to answer yeah. Jello, no? I mean, I'm expecting there will be you know, changes also and, and uh, flexibility in how they do things from before to this COVID and as we move forward. And what I can assure you, I know someone from PESA, and make sure your question will uh, reach his office. And who knows, maybe you can get him as our next guest speaker here so we can clarify some of all these things. So, but uh, I agree. I mean, and not just the PESA per se, that, that, that all the government involved in this industry should be, uh, should show support. I mean, being one of the biggest uh, contributor in the Philippine economy, I mean, we expect the, the, the support from all the sectors. I mean, the academe, the the telco, definitely, I mean, the real estate provider. So all of these things. I remember when when all of this is starting, I mean, all of us in this industry, in the support group, is really working hand-on-hand hand to make sure that, you know, that here we are right now. I mean, we're like the, the BGC right now, the, the, all these uh, IT development companies and, and areas right now. It's because of how we work together before. And I'm sure since we've done that before, I mean, we can do that again and, and improve it uh, moving forward. I mean, that, that's how I see it. Okay. So, so I hope. Um, okay. Yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, to, to add on what, what you're saying, yeah, I think in general, the organizations like PESA really, uh, they, they work based on inputs from the members and from the business community, right? Like associations like IBPAP or Chamber mm -hmm. of Commerce and so I think uh, every every business group has to to voice their opinions to, their uh, to the yeah to, to to do their part to put out position papers on their view on the situation because again every every organization right is is impacted one way or another so so the, it's a, it's not exactly a moving target but everybody has has an impact right so everybody is willing to listen to other support groups and and figure out what to do so I think as far as PESA is concerned. Uh, I think the best approach is for business groups to voice their, their opinion and make recommendations, right? Then it will be up to the government and the review boards to consider those uh, proposals and, and decide whether they are good for, for, for the greater community, right? I think that's all the time we have for questions today. If um, for some members of the audience, if you still have questions, please feel free to email us. Just respond to the email we sent with the link for this webinar. Um, and thank you, Sherwin. And thank you, Yanis. Thank you. Uh, thank back you. to you, Raymond, for... No, I just certainly it's a very interesting mm -hmm. discussion, guys. We really thank you for, for being with us again today, for sharing your, your knowledge, your expertise and experience. And uh, as we move forward, as I mentioned, to, to tackle this uh, BPO outlook, I mean, we, we have uh, guests also in the next uh, upcoming webinars where, where we'll hear um, also the, the impact of COVID-19 in, uh, in the different sectors uh, supporting this, this current industry. So we really want to thank you guys for, for being with us, uh, to our audience. Um, thank you for, for being with us today and supporting the webinar series that uh, the company is providing. And uh, we hope to see you again in our next uh, webinar uh, series. That's all. Uh, this Friday, I just want to invite everyone who's already here, this Friday, part two of um, this BPO Outlook series um, is scheduled. Same time. Don't forget to register, Friday, 10 o'clock. So we'll see you then. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.